Greetings everyone. Well, once again, my giant spider presentation was removed by YouTube for copyright infringement. So I have removed the three old black and white movie clips from the presentation and loaded it for the third time. So hopefully this is third time lucky. Now, as some of you have been asking about news on the search for McKelly and Bambi, we will start with that, including a little more background information that you may or may not be aware of. On the 7th of April 2013, brother Richard Hendrick, an Irish Franciscan monk who has had a long interest in cryptozoology, photographed this African carving in a collection held by the Rose Minion Missionary Fathers, who are based in County Tipperary, Ireland. Now, Brother Hendrick believes that this intriguing statuette has been in the house since the 1950s. The carving depicts two animals, a larger individual with a long neck and tail, a body covered with large scales, sharp teeth, and an unusual rayed structure under its tail, and a smaller individual with the same characteristics but with a very short neck. Now the non-existent neck on the smaller animal is quite odd given its otherwise strong similarity to the bigger animal. Researcher Penny O'Dell suggests that the artist may not have had a sufficient amount of wood to finish the carving and give the juvenile a long neck. American crypto author Matt Belay, who does not subscribe to the living dinosaur theory for Mokili and Bembi, commented that it looks to him to be a modern creation, possibly inspired by Western interest in the Mokili and Bembi rather than an example of traditional indigenous artwork. However, this carving predates the Macon expeditions by at least 25 years, and the only information we have on this carving is that it was brought back to Ireland by Irish missionaries from Equatorial Africa in the 1950s. Now the sharp looking teeth are interesting, and we can compare these to the teeth in a Camarasaurus skull here, and a Diplodica skull here. So some sauropods had wicked looking teeth. Now if the Mokeli and Bambi had the same choppers, then little wonder they could kill hippos with biting as well as tail lashing. Also, the tough scaly skin of the carving is identical to the eyewitness accounts and drawings of the L'Aquila Bambi of Cameroon by present day eyewitnesses as seen in these examples. And the fossilized skin impressions of sauropods found by paleontologists does also seem to match the reports of tough or scaled skin of the L'Aquila Bambis. Now this confounds the argument by evolutionists that any dinosaur that has survived over 65 million years of evolution would have a drastically different body plan today than they would have eons ago. Now, I do not want to turn this presentation into a creation-evolution debate, but the 15 or so Western eyewitnesses that have observed these animals for themselves also describe the long neck and bulbous bodies of these impressive animals. And we will be looking at those accounts in the next presentation. Now, during his 1981 Congo expedition, Herman Regustus received a Mokeli and Bembi sighting report from Colonel Emmanuel Mozad Zidi, Chief of the Air Force Operations and Logistics of the then People's Republic of the Congo. Now, after his arrival in Brazzaville, um, Regustus met with Colonel Mozad Dizi, who told him that in his youth, some 20 years beforehand, he was accompanying a group from the village of Itanga when they spotted an unfamiliar animal in the forest. When Regustus asked Mozadizi to draw the animal, he produced a vague and unesthetic sketch showing what appeared to be a bulbous body and a long neck. Now generally he described an animal that was dark colored with a bulbous body, a long thin neck and a small head. Unfortunately that's all I can tell you, but this is Colonel Mozadizi's drawing of the animal he observed in the Congo forest around 1961. 
Now here we see another carving that showed up in a souvenir shop in the Congo in the 1980s. The indigenous artist was clearly trying to depict a long-necked, long-tailed animal. Notice that it has stubby legs that match up well with the appendages of the Mokele and Bembe, and a curious frill down the back, much like the spikes many paleontologists know that sauropods, like the Diplodocus, actually had. There is no depiction of any other appendages. Now this figurine is about 15 inches long and stands 6 inches tall. Now Dave Wetzel is currently investigating the origins of this curious carving and I hope we will have more information to share with you in the near future. Now for Expedition News. Michel Ballot has decided to return to Cameroon in November this year. He will, again, explore the Upper Jar River around the Inki Falls. I personally think that focusing on one area too much is counterproductive. Unless he puts up at least six game trail cameras in the locations where these intriguing footprints have been found in the past. At least three different sets of prints have been discovered in the Upper Jar region. Oh, and by the way, these footprints have baffled French zoologists who are familiar with African animals. Dave Wetzel of Genesis Park Ministry is planning on returning to Cameroon in January 2023. This would be a better time to go, as the rainy season would be over and the water level in the rivers would be dropping. Now I also hope to go with Dave and take my intrepid youngest son Andrew with me. We will team up with our old friend Pierre Sima and float down the length of the Boomba River, just as we did in November 2000. According to our informants who live along the Boomba, the Ja and the Ngoko rivers, as you can see here, the end of January and the beginning of February would be the best time to observe the Lakila Bembes. Now here is Dave in our inflatable boat on the Boomba River over 20 years ago. My, how time flies. Now this time I will be taking game trail cameras, night vision binoculars, a waterproof drone and a small hydrophone kit to play hippo vocalizations in the water to see if we can attract a Lakila Bembe, as they are completely intolerant of hippos. We will also take at least 20 disposable cameras to distribute among some of the people there, in the hope that they can obtain photographic evidence in return for a nice cash reward. Okay, so on to the giant spider presentation, which I hope will remain on my channel for a long time yet. So again, may I say thank you again for your patience, and I will be back soon with that presentation regarding Western eyewitnesses who have observed Mokele and Bambis for themselves. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you soon. Well, good afternoon everyone. This is crypto hunter Bill Gibbons back to upload the video on giant spiders for a second time. The video was blocked worldwide by YouTube because it contained a copyrighted content from the 1943 Tarzan's Desert Adventure. And so I had to remove that particular clip and reload the video all over again. So my sincere apologies for that. Now for other news. This year I will be introducing a series of short video presentations, a sort of a cryptozoology roundup worldwide. I hope that you will enjoy those in between my bigger projects. Also, I will be going to Okanagan Lake in British Columbia in May to film a documentary on the famous Ogopogo. I will also be interviewing a number of eyewitnesses who live locally and have seen the Ogopogo for themselves. The second part of the documentary will be filmed at the end of September, which apparently is the best time of year to observe them, which could correspond with the animal's breeding cycle. Well, who knows? Now, as always, I appreciate all of you, my supporters and subscribers, and I will be working diligently to bring more quality content to you very soon. Until then, thank you again for your patience, and I'll see you soon. Right, now, reports of monstrous spiders have crept into the world of cryptozoology since the early 20th century. 
Now, giant spiders have featured in books, comics, and movies for decades. But reports of the real thing tend to surface from time to time. But before we delve into modern-day reports of giant spiders, let's take a brief walk through early history. The discovery of this particular fossil, which was found in volcanic ash in Inner Mongolia, is important because it makes this particular spider fossil, named Nephila jurassica, the oldest known species of the largest web-weaving spiders on the earth today, the golden orb weavers. Now today's golden orb versions can grow to an impressive size. This photo shows an orb spider feeding on a hummingbird that was caught in the spider's web. To give you an idea of scale, this giant orb spider was filmed in a Cambodian restaurant. The biggest spider in the world today, at least one recognized by science, is the Goliath bird eater, known as Therophosa blondi. It weighs over 6 ounces and has a body length of 5 to 6 inches. In spite of its name, this ground-dwelling spider rarely feeds on birds. The giant huntsman spider, or Heteropoda maxima, is a species of the huntsman spider found in Laos. It is considered the world's largest spider by leg span, which can reach up to 30 centimeters or just over 12 inches. More recently, it's been found in Florida and is regarded as an invasive species. It feeds primarily on cockroaches. Although this species is venomous, but is not usually deadly to humans. The bite can, however, cause local swelling and pain, which is sometimes accompanied by nausea, headaches, vomiting, irregular pulse rate, and heart palpitations. Here's one feeding on a cockroach. The first account concerning a giant spider came to my attention in the late 1980s, during my long correspondence with Margaret Lloyd, a former resident of Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe. She relocated to the city of Bristol in England in the 1980s. She had read about my Congo expeditions and told me about her late parents, Reginald and Marguerite Lloyd, who had encountered a giant spider during the 1938 honeymoon adventure while motoring through a forest road in the old Belgian Congo. As they were driving slowly through the forest trail in an old Ford vehicle, they both spotted a large object crossing the road ahead of them. Thinking at first it was a large monkey, Reginald slammed on the brakes, unable to believe his eyes. Slowly crossing the road just a few feet ahead of them was a gigantic spider at least three feet in diameter. Marguerite recoiled in horror as Reginald attempted to get a quick snap of the giant arachnid with his box camera. But the spider quickly disappeared into the forest, no doubt startled by the size and noise of the Lloyd's truck. Now Marguerite was so upset she wanted to get out of Africa for good, and who can blame her? The common language of the Congo Basin is Lingala, and although there are some variants to this language, which is spoken by over 10 million people, the rough translation for giant spider in Lingala is Mobali Elulu, that is Mobali Elulu. Mobali is the Lingala word for great or giant, and Elulu is the Lingala word for spider.
Incidentally, you might have seen this photograph of Mr. and Mrs. Lloyd on the web, listed as public domain, but it is a composite of two separate photos made into one, as you can see here, and all three images are copyrighted to me, so please ask if you want to use this photo at any time in the future. As a side note, Reginald Kenneth Lloyd was born on the 21st of July 1897 in England and died on the 17th of July 1977 in Lusaka, the capital city of Zambia. He is buried here in Leopard Hill Memorial Park Cemetery in the city. Marguerite Lloyd was born in London on May 6th, 1914 and died in the English seaside town of Western Supermare on the 19th of August 1989. As you can see here, it's a very nice place. But one has to wonder how many other explorers, missionaries and adventurers have encountered sizable spiders, but never thought to record their experiences for posterity. But the Congo Basin is not the only place where giant spiders are known to inhabit. Northwest of the vast Congo Basin lies Cameroon. Approximately 40% of Cameroon is densely forested. During my first expedition to Cameroon in November 2000, Dave Wetzel and I focused on any reports that the local Barca people would have on Mokele and Bembe and other strange animals that might be new to the world of cryptozoology. But it was not until our return in 2002 that I remembered to ask the pygmy chief Timbo Robert about the giant spider. He casually mentioned that, had I asked him two years before, he could have shown us just such a specimen in the forest, not far from his village. These monsters are called Jibafofi, meaning giant spider in the Barca language. The word Jiba means great or giant, and the word Fofi is Barca for spider. Now these particular spiders are said to attain a leg span of up to a colossal five or six feet. They are brown in colour with a purple abdomen and lay peanut-sized eggs which produce yellow hatchlings that turn brown as they mature. On this occasion, I remember to ask those Barker who had encountered the Jibafofi to draw a life-sized image on the ground. The photos of these drawings are seen here for the first time. Although these images represent smaller examples of the Jibafofi, we were told that they grow far larger. These spiders live almost entirely in the dense forests of Cameroon, where they are encountered most often. Between 1990 and 2010, Cameroon lost 18% of its forest cover, or around 4.5 million hectares. This is criminal. Cameroon's forests contain 2,696 million metric tons of carbon in living forest biomass. But the continuing deforestation threatens to drive many rare species into extinction, including the Jibafofi and other unknown species that may become extinct before they are ever discovered and officially recognized by science. But Africa is not the only place where monstrous arachnids have been encountered. One of the most startling giant spider reports comes from Leesville in Louisiana in the United States. According to Mr. William Sladen, it was here while walking northwards along Highway 171 to church one cool night in 1948 that he, his wife and their three young grandsons had spied a gigantic spider hairy, black, and described as the size of a washtub. It emerged from a ditch just ahead of them and crossed the road before disappearing into the bush on the other side. Not surprisingly, the family never again walked along that particular route to church in the evening. Another mystery spider encounter happened in Papua New Guinea during World War II. During an interview with American cryptozoologist Rob Morphy of AmericanMonsters.com on the popular radio show Coast to Coast AM, a caller by the name of Craig stated that his grandfather encountered a giant spider while on the island. According to Craig's grandfather, the spider measured an immense three feet from tip to tip, but was not hairy like many of the reported giant spiders. 
Instead, it was shiny and emerald green in colour. Craig's grandfather was so horrified by this unwelcome confrontation that he drew his machete and hacked the huge spider to pieces. On the 8th of April 2013, American cryptozoologist Craig Woolheater posted on the Cryptomunda website a communication that he'd received from someone known only as Mr. Maxima. According to Mr. Maxima, his father-in-law, who was a Vietnam veteran, was part of a five-man recon unit that encountered giant spiders over two feet wide while engaged in combat operations. The spiders were described as possessing bodies of the size of dinner plates, and with their legs yielded a total span of 20 to 30 inches. These terrifying arachnids were always spotted near creeks or other water sources, and were so tough that even after being shot by the team with their M16 rifles, the spiders were still able to move around. Reports of comparatively massive spiders have also been recorded in the vast rainforest of South America. In 2008, the American television series Monster Quest accompanied tarantula expert Rick C. West on an expedition to investigate a dense forested area in Venezuela near the Orinoco River close to the border with Colombia. Local villagers spoke of a giant spider about the size of a human being similar in appearance to a tarantula, and big enough to seize and devour small dogs, chickens, and even the occasional human child. Rick did not find his giant spider, but perhaps one day he will succeed in his mission. And we wish him luck. England seems an unlikely country that would produce giant spiders, but in February 2013, Adam Bird from the city of Nottingham posted a remarkable story on Facebook. A local librarian known only as Sheila encountered the spider around 12 years previously in 2001. One evening, as Sheila was driving along Nottingham Stonebridge Road, her car's headlights lit up what at first she thought to be a hedgehog crawling towards a disused factory. As she drove nearer, the hedgehog was in fact a very large spider, similar in appearance to a tarantula, but much bigger. Sheila estimated that its body was the size of a dinner plate and complete with its long hairy legs was at least two feet wide. She watched in horrified silence as the spider crawled through an old fence towards a nearby derelict factory. Needless to say, the memory of this unsettling encounter has remained with her ever since. But the question still remains, can spiders really grow up to enormous sizes? far bigger than the Goliath spider of South America. Skeptics claim that pygmy hunters in equatorial Africa are mistaking tree-climbing monkeys for giant spiders. This is nonsense. These two photographs, both taken by me, firstly in the Congo in 1986 and later in Cameroon in 2003, show monkeys that have been killed for food. Monkey meat is a prime source of protein for many people in equatorial Africa and is sold in marketplaces there. So the very suggestion that pygmy and Bantu tribes people are mistaking tree climbing monkeys for giant spiders is simply ridiculous. Others have suggested that giant coconut crabs, such as this one, photographed in the process of killing a seabird, or giant spider crabs like this one, can easily be mistaken for giant spiders. But these impressive crustaceans live in the sea, and although they can venture on dry land, they live far from the jungles of Central Africa, South America, and even the forests of Louisiana. Conventional science also argues against giant spiders. Arachnids take in oxygen and expel carbon dioxide like human beings. But they use tracheal tubes and book lungs that depend on the diffusion through small openings. 
This is much slower than our own breathing system. Plus, spider blood, or hemolymph, a fluid equivalent to blood in most invertebrates, is copper-based, which is not as efficient as our iron-based hemoglobin. But this does not necessarily rule out the existence of giant spiders that may possess a far more efficient respiratory system that would allow them to grow far beyond the limitations reached by the Goliath spider or the far more intimidating Huntsman spider. So where does this leave us? The eyewitness evidence is still nevertheless pretty convincing. Rational people such as professional soldiers, a public librarian, and Reginald Lloyd, who was a chemist by profession, did not expect to encounter monstrous arachnids up close and personal. But they did, and science has no answer for them. So if you find yourself in the Congo forest as an ecotourist, taking photographs of gorillas like this man, or paddling through the swamps of Louisiana, you might receive an unexpected visit by an eight-legged horror like this one. So keep your eyes and ears open and your cameras ready.